That was perfect timing, Brent. It's like <laughs> right as the music stops, perfect. So, hey, so as Mikey mentioned, myself and Brent and almost all of his family, almost got them all there. Your, your daughter had to go get an internship and she's adulting. She is. So your oldest, yep, yep. yep. And, uh, but we, we just got back um, kind of late Wednesday night and then he, Brent even got to go to Chicago after that. So if what we're saying doesn't make perfect sense, we're just gonna blame it on jet lag at this point. So a little disclaimer. Uh, but Brent um, just wanted to talk a little bit about what we did was we went over and we're investigating kind of a new opportunity for our church in Albania. And I won't put you on the spot, but I'm, I'm sure there's some of y'all are like, where is that? I don't even know where Albania is. I didn't really know either. But uh, we got to go over there. It's right above Greece, by the way, kind of in the, the Balkan Peninsula there. And just to be work with a ministry called Crew. And so, Brent, if you don't mind, I was going to ask you just a couple questions just to get your perspective on the trip and uh, sure. as you guys were there. So I guess the first question is, this seems like a little bit of a crazy idea to go over to this place. Why did you say yes and bring most of your family with you? What's that about? Sure. Uh, the, the short answer is uh, the Lord overcame all fears and doubts and, and challenges that we were facing to, to go over there. But um, Nine years ago, my wife and I were at small group and we met a, a young missionary couple from Albania and they were just on staff with, with crew and they were raising support. And uh, so we agreed to start supporting them and praying for them. And um, fast forward to last November, Aldo um, Rostimi, who was the, uh, the missionary, um, wanted to come over and meet some, with some of the donors and talk about some of the new things going on. So he invited us, uh, well, he wanted to meet with us, and so I brought him to Stonebridge and talked about some of the opportunities there, and he suggested we take a, a trip over and, and come visit. Um, I did not want to do it. I, was, uh, I, I wanted to be faithful to the Lord if he was calling me to go. I had the, the men on, on Saturday mornings. So there's a little Bible study here for the men had all those guys praying for me, had my family praying for me. I do not like long flights. Anyway, the Lord overcame all of that and uh, we ended up being able to go. Awesome, awesome. So, so we, we spent a few days there together. So Brent, in our experience, what would be, are there any kind of standout moments for you that kind of from the experience you'd like to share about? Absolutely, and I, I think some of the, the video earlier was showing some of it, but we had a, a, an amazing night. One night, um, we were called to the college ministry in Duras, and Duras is right on the coast, um, the, the western coast in Albania, and at that meeting, they suggested we throw a Texas party, which they, the college staff would use to bring new students in, because they, they love Americans over there, so they wanted to uh, come and, and, and promote a Texas party. My, my wife is amazingly gifted at throwing parties, so she, um, she had unbelievable plans. We had inflatable, uh, not, not inflatable, we had pop-up cornhole. We had uh, some horseshoes. I brought an American football so we could throw, throw that and teach the kids to throw. And then Brian and Josh were fantastic. Brian led uh, uh, deep in the heart of Texas for uh, the Albanians. <laughs> On a ukulele. <laughs> My first time on a ukulele to leave that. <laughs> but, um, and then they asked us to share the gospel, so uh, I had an opportunity to do that. And um, after that, one of the girls who was attending for the first time this college ministry uh, came up and, and just had a per perplexed look on her face and said, why on earth would you come all the way from America to Albania? And it was just a great opportunity to, to share just how Christ's love in our hearts just moves us to want to share that incredible gift with others and and so got to share that with her and um, as a result she decided she wanted to to learn more about jesus and so she's actually at a at a camp right now in we found out that she uh, decided to do a camp uh, there in albania and we'll wait and see what the lord has in store that's awesome yeah. i love it i love it so as we you know kind of process now about you know our trip in your mind, Brent, do you, why, why do you see this potential partnership with Crew in Albania as a good opportunity for Stonebridge? The Crew staff is unbelievably intelligent and strategic, and uh, they made it so easy for us. I mean, we showed up, and, and they just you know, put us in opportunities to use natural gifts, and then the Holy Spirit took over, and I mean, just amazing things were done through that. 
Um, they've got some great ministries going, great opportunities to serve. Right now they have a, a, a they were given a piece of property um, right on the Adriatic Sea, just a little bit north of Duras, and they're building a camp, and they're trying to uh, use that camp. They call it the lighthouse. They want it to be a light for um, people to come and, and learn more about Christ and then go forward um, and do amazing things in Albania. And it, it's a great opportunity because Albania, um, they're open to the gospel. Yeah. They are definitely open. It's, um, you know, it's a dark place um, in the sense of not having, um, not having the gospel there and under communism. Yeah. Uh, I think you'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, yeah. anyway, there's yeah. some great opportunities. Awesome. Yeah, it's, uh, Brent and I, when we went to the crew office, they have a world map in there. And the way that it was one of those flat maps where Greenland looks like the largest piece of land in the whole world, you know, kind of thing. But it was the flat map. And Albania was like right in the middle. It was interesting kind of where it's located. And not only do they have a heart to reach the people who are open to the gospel there, but they are already sending people all over the place from Albania as missionaries. So it really is pretty inspiring to be a part of that. Pretty cool. It has definitely changed. It will have an eternal impact on our family. So yeah. highly encourage yeah. anyone to pray about it and go if you're called. Awesome. So we'll have more information as we kind of process, probably put some things out on the website and uh, give you an opportunity to express interest. Love to pray real quick for, for God's leading. Father, thank you for the opportunity, even as Mikey prayed, that uh, we can be part of an amazing church that not only desires to impact our local community, but also to send hope across the world where you're opening up those windows of opportunity. And we pray you just guide us as a church about this potential partnership. And thank you for the Tuckers and their willingness to step out and go and pray you continue to bless them as, as they also seek your will. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's thank Brent. Thank you, Brent, for coming up here. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. All right. So, uh, yeah, so we are kicking off a brand new series today. It's, it's kind of ironic that we were really close to Rome. This ser series is called My Summer in Rome, and we are in Greece and Albania, just right across. In fact, uh, here's an easy way if you ever want to know where Albania is. This was explained to us. So, you know, Italy looks like a boot, you know, from Texas. We know what boots look like. And uh, there's part of the boot, you've kind of got the spur on the heel of the boot, when you look at Italy, the map, if that spur were to kind of kick back, it would kick right into Albania. That's the way we were, it was described to us. So if you wanna know where Albania is. So we were really close, but didn't quite make it to Rome. Ironically, Paul had not made it to Rome either when he wrote the letter to the Romans. And so we're looking at, a, we're gonna be unpacking a series over the book of Romans. I just wanna let you guys know, we will not do an exhaustive, in-depth study because I've heard that could take like 14 to 15 years to do that, and so some of y'all would hang in there and some of you are like, y'all need to wrap this up. This is going on for a while. But we're gonna spend a few weeks kind of looking at some highlights, some stopping and admiring just some of the incredible truths in this letter. Uh, there's a lot for us to learn from it. And today will be more of an introduction, just kind of looking at how Paul uh, introduces this letter. And you know, how did, this, how did this church in Rome get started? We really don't fully know. We know that Paul did not start the church in Rome. Uh, we think that maybe there may have been some Jewish uh, people from Rome who came to Jerusalem during Pentecost and maybe heard Peter's sermon because we know many, many thousands accepted Christ that day and maybe they were some from Rome and they went back and started some house churches and we know that Paul longed to get to meet these Christians in Rome. Obviously a very strategic place there in the very center of the Roman Empire. And so, but we really don't know fully how it got started. Um, and so, like I said, today we're gonna, we're gonna just jump in there. The, the title that I came up with for this message is Finding Joy in the Journey. And I think that as we look at Paul's perspective today and really the first 17 verses, he's gonna introduce himself. We're gonna see his words to the Romans, the Roman Christians that he's writing to in the letter. And I think we're gonna find that he gives us a perspective that we can really learn a lot from. I don't know about you, but it can be hard to find joy sometimes. You know, driving to church today, I go by Walmart and to see, you know, gas prices where they are, like 449 did not fill me with joy when I saw that. I was like, ouch, that really hurts, you know? And just stuff with our economy and inflation doesn't exactly 
get you excited. And, and there's a lot of just stuff in the news right now and things that are happening even right here in our local community that has been very heavy and very difficult. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to feel down. And so I think we can learn from Paul what he has to say in here about where to find joy. And so we're gonna kick it off. If you wanna turn in your Bible, we'll be in Romans chapter one. And we'll start in verse one and just make a few points uh, from these passages. So it says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith in his namesake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're gonna pause there for a second. What do we learn even from that opening introduction to the letter? If you wanna fill in the blank, uh, number one, first thing that really stood out to me is we need to find joy in your identity. Find joy in your identity. Embrace who you are in Christ. That really just jumped out to me as Paul introduces himself. Think about the way that this is what he wanted them to know about who he was, that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. That's what he leads out with. That is his primary identity. That he had a calling on his life as an apostle, and that just means sent. He was sent by God to bring this good news around the world to the Gentiles. And he was, you see his Jewish roots, you know, Paul's story, he was a Pharisee, he came from a Jewish background, and he sees that what Jesus did, it's a continuation of God's story. It wasn't some just new thing, but he was the promised one from the line of David that, and was proven to be so through his resurrection. And so he has this calling and I love even some of the words he gives to the, to the Roman Christians, and that's for you and me too. He says, you belong to Jesus Christ. You are his holy people. You are loved by God. And so there's just some great, powerful things to think about for us. How, when you look in the mirror, how do you define yourself? Where do you pull your identity? I love, this is a, a quote that I've used before from Morgan Snyder, it's there in your, in your handout. It says, we cannot live beyond the identity we have embraced. I love that because there are certain things true about you if you're a Christian. You are loved by God. You have a calling on your life. You are holy and forgiven. But unless you embrace those things, then they won't mean anything to you. You can choose not to embrace them. You can choose not to believe them. And it's interesting, I was doing a little study on Paul, and you may not know what the name Paul means. It means little. How about that, right? You know, especially for the guys in here, wouldn't you love it if my name means little? That's awesome. I'm feeling great about that name, right? I'm, I'm little, yes. And uh, I came across this ancient writing that gave some clues about Paul's physical appearance. I thought this was interesting. It says that he was a man of small stature, or little, so maybe he really lived up to his name, with a bald head and crooked legs. This is not starting off well. In a good state of body, though, so we got something positive there. I like this one. With eyebrows meeting. He had eyebrows that met in the middle, which, you know, we would call that a unibrow, right? Um, so apparently, according to this, Paul had that going. Uh, his nose somewhat hooked, a hooked nose, wow. Full of friendliness, for now he appeared like a man and now he had the face of an angel. So I kind of gather from that, Paul wasn't you know, someone that's like this just male model walking around, like look at me, I mean look, at, look how great I look, right? Um, Paul could have been pretty discouraged about his physical appearance, but he chose not to embrace that as his identity. He could have walked around and said, oh, I'm just not, 
man, I'm not tall, I'm just short, I've got a uni brow, I'm just, man, this is who I am, right? I'm just embracing that. He didn't embrace that. He embraced who he was in Christ. That's what he focused on. Something else about Paul. Paul was not a gifted speaker, which stinks when you're called to go out and share the gospel with people. That's a bummer when you don't have like a good speaking gift, right? It's like, come on, God, really? Um, in fact, listen to this. 2 Corinthians 10.10 10 talks about what people thought about Paul. It says, for some say his letters are weighty and forceful, but in person, he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. It's like, ouch. I mean, that's, that's kind of brutal, right? And so he apparently didn't have a real strong, dynamic speaking voice, yet he didn't let that discourage him either. He could have. He could have said, I'm just Paul, and I can't speak very well, and I've got a unibrow, and, you know, but he didn't do that. He didn't do that. And then here's another thing about Paul. Paul had a pretty rough past. He was personally involved in persecuting Christians, the death of Christians, arresting Christians. And God, you know, changed him as he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. But Paul could have easily just been discouraged about his past and said, you know, I'm just, I'm just Paul with the unibrow and not a good speaker and I've got a horrible past and I'm, that's just who I am. But he didn't let any of those things define him. What he comes out and says is, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I am sent as an apostle. I get to bring this incredible good news to the Gentiles around the world of what God is doing. That is what he chose to embrace. So I love even that first point that we see in here. What identity, when you look in the mirror, what are you choosing to embrace about yourself? I would challenge you and me to embrace who you are in Christ. It continues on as we, as we move on to Verse eight, he says, first, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son is my witness how I constantly remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Here's the second thing that, that clearly comes out that Paul found joy in, even in the difficulties. Number two, find joy in your relationships. Find joy in your relationships. Love paves the way for faith. I love this quote from Teddy Roosevelt. It says, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That is very, very true. You see this all throughout Paul's letters. He is making statements all the time about his thinking about these people. He's praying for them, even records prayers for people. He loved people so well. There's all these like greetings and even weird stuff like greet each other with a holy kiss. I'm kind of glad we don't do that here at Stonebridge. It'd be kind of strange. We do the holy fist bump or handshake, which works great. But he was, he loved people and he built friendships and he had these traveling companions. This was something he found joy in. I love, uh, there's a verse that I've really loved for a long time, 1 Thessalonians 2.8. Paul writes, we loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. I love that challenge. You know, what Brent talked about, you know, doing the Texas party. By the way, the Texas party was pretty humorous because here we are in Albania and we covered this room in Texas flags. It's like we came in and conquered Albania for Texas. It was really strange. Uh, but we're in there having fun, playing horseshoes, doing all these games, doing line dances. They tried to teach me Albanian dances. I was horrible, I could not get it, but you know, they laughed at me, so that was cool. They, we had fun, but all of that was about loving people. It was about, I'm willing to share my life with you. And we see Paul found joy in that. It wasn't just, oh, I'm just coming in, I'm gonna stand up on a stage and just say a few things and then leave. But he said, no, no, I'm gonna share my life with you. I'm gonna listen to you. And one of the things I loved uh, on our trip brag on Brent for a minute. So we, we had a lot of just traveling all over the place and we had to drive, we had to do taxi drivers and, 
and we had to go with van drivers, different places, and every time that we would get in a new, and we had a new driver, Brent would ask them their name. Such a small thing. But it challenged me, it reminded me that every person you come across is someone that God loves and that God wants a relationship with them. And so we were able to get to know our drivers and get to know their stories and it was so cool. Sometimes we can see people as a means to an end. We say, okay, you're my cashier, you're, you're, you're my driver, you're my repair person, whatever. But through Paul, he teaches us, find joy in loving people well. And even this, like this gathering together, this is special. In these kind of gatherings, we encourage each other. You see that too, Paul's saying, I wanna, I want us to mutually encourage one another. Even right now, I've got, I've got brothers in Christ praying for me over different things, and there's this joy in walking alongside of other people. So, number two, I think it's a huge point that you see in this introduction. Find joy in your relationships. And it goes on into verse 13. Paul continues, he says, I, don't, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Let me ask you all a question. Have you guys ever made plans and it didn't go 100% according to your plans? Anybody ever done that before? Anybody, anybody lived your whole life and every plan you've made has worked out perfectly? Anybody? Nobody? Okay, yeah, all right, cool. So y'all aren't are that much different than me, yeah. Paul is talking about that here. He's saying, I keep making plans to get to Rome and stuff keeps coming up. One of the roads that I learned about on our trip is a road that goes from Istanbul, Turkey, all the way to Duras, Albania. It was a road built by the Romans called the Via Ignatia. It's almost 700 miles long. And Paul would have traveled this road often on some of his missionary journeys. You guys remember the town of Thessaloniki or Thessalonica, the Th Thessalonians, that was right along that road. And on his second missionary journey, Paul most likely was thinking, I'm gonna go through Thessalonica, and then I'm gonna keep on going towards Rome. Wrong, God had other plans. He gets to Thessalonica, he does what he normally does, he goes and he preaches to the Jewish people in the synagogue, sharing with them out of their own scriptures, this is who Jesus is, he is the Messiah. Let me show you what it says about him. And as he was doing that, many believed, but then it said some of the Jews didn't like it, they were jealous, and they put together a mob to basically take Paul out. And before the mob could get Paul, Paul had to escape to a little town called Berea, where he also ministered to people. Now, Berea now is off the main road. They, he took a detour. He detoured down to Berea. Then the mob came down there, too. And then they're like, we gotta get you out of here. This mob is relentless. And so they put him on a boat, and he sailed to Athens for another detour, which is way off the road now, and eventually wound up in Corinth. So point number three is this. We can learn from Paul. Find joy in the detours. Find joy in the detours. We are gonna have lots of detours in life, things we didn't plan for. It's all part of God's plan. I love this quote from Jamie Kern Lima. She says, our setbacks are often God's setups. It's another one I've used before that I just love that. Our setbacks are often God's setups. On our, our trip to Albania, Albania is right above Greece. And we had the uh, opportunity to go down to Greece as well while we were there. And we got to visit a couple places that were some of the detours along Paul's journey. We got to go to Athens and Mars Hill, which is right below where the uh, Acropolis is and the Parthenon. That was a place where Paul debated with some of the philosophers. And then we went to Corinth as well, the town of Corinth. So got a couple of quick little videos that we were gonna show you from that, that I had my son pull out his iPhone and here we go. But on this hill in the days uh, that Paul would have been here, the Greek philosophers of that day would gather together and Paul very courageously shows up in the midst of that group and begins to explain to them who this unknown God is. I love that part where he was walking around and he was reading their poetry and looking around and he saw an inscription to the unknown God. And he used that as an opportunity to be able to interact with these philosophers of that day and 
you know, just like today, some of them were very, very eager to hear more. In fact, they invited him back the next day. Other people laughed him, laughed him off and thought it was, thought he was crazy. But because of his boldness, because he was willing to step out, we, 2,000 years later, know about Christ. And the gospel has spread, just like it said in Acts 1-8, to the uttermost parts of the earth. All right, so that was at Mars Hill. And then uh, I think there's another quick clip uh, from Corinth as well. Another one of Paul's We're stops. here in the ancient town of Corinth. And this was a place that Paul would have spent almost two years. And this was a, a place that was very strategic. There was a lot of trade here. It was a pretty prosperous place in the time of the Roman Empire. And a lot of exchanges of ideas and different cultures here. And Paul spent most of his time in the synagogue. And there were many who believed. In fact, God spoke to Paul and told him to, to remain there for a while because there were many people in that city that would eventually come to believe. But it was a difficult place. In fact, they brought him before the Bema, which was a place of judgment just right over that way. And they uh, were really kind of putting him on trial. But the ruler of Gallio didn't want anything to do with it and basically let him go. And, and then he also moved to another house of, of another believer in town and spent a lot of time there. This, this whole area here around Corinth, too, is kind of where the Olympic Games got started. So athletics... And all of that was very, very popular here. Uh, so just again, another place where Paul uh, and, and Courage uh, decided to come and bring the gospel here. And again, we are benefiting 2,000 years later from the seeds that were planted here through all kinds of different empires that would come throughout history. And yet, um, God is still bringing the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. All right, sorry for my... Uh casualness there. It was really hot in Corinth. It was a lot like Houston. I was like, I feel like I'm at home, man. Just immediately step out and I'm sweating profusely. That is awesome. Uh, But both of these, in a sense, were like detours to Paul, but they were completely part of God's plan. I love uh, in Acts 17, it talks about the response that people had in Athens there at Mars Hill. It says, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. So there was people prepared to hear on this detour. And then in Corinth, in Acts 18, it says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent. For I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So I love that these were not the places Paul thought he was gonna go, but God had significant ministry he did in those places. And the same is true for our life. There are many of us, and you may feel like you're on a detour right now. You're like, this is not what I had planned for my life. This is not where I thought I would be. Be encouraged that God will use you right where you are. I have a friend, Colin Millar, who's this crazy, crazy South African, if you've ever met him, Jesus-loving freak, and uh, he was cycling one day, he does a, does a lot of cycling, and he, he had an accident, and he had to go to the hospital. You're thinking, this is a bad day, this is not good. And anyway, he, he later shares that while he's there, he is praying for the nurses, he's praying for the doctors. I think he shares Christ with one of them and maybe one of them accepts Jesus and you're like, what? This is crazy, man. That's just the way that he lives. He sees the detours, the setbacks as opportunities that God is still at work. And so we can find joy that even if we're not at the place we thought we wanted to be, God is still ready to use us right where we are. And then the last little section we'll read today In verse 14, Paul would say, I'm obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And so the fourth thing from this introduction to Romans, if you wanna write this down, 
is to find joy in the gospel. It's not outdated and still changes lives. Find joy in the gospel. One thing I didn't realize is that Paul made it as far as Albania. He actually preached the gospel in Albania. If you look at Romans 15, 18 through 19, he says this, I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way around to the Illyricum, Illyricum, I knew I'd mess that up, Illyricum, thank you, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. What is the Illyricum? Well, that's modern day Albania. So Paul actually preached the gospel there, probably people responded to it 2,000 years ago. Well, as I learned more about Albania's history, it was interesting because they have been conquered by all kinds of different empires over their past. Two of them to point out, for 400 years, they were under the rule of the Ottoman Turk Empire, which is an Islamic empire. Many of them were forced to become Muslim during those period, for 400 years. So you can imagine just any, any churches that would have been there were basically converted to mosques. And then in the, around the late 1940s, communism came into Albania. And during that time, they declared Albania an atheistic nation. No religions were allowed to practice at all. They shut down every religious institution. And then in 1991, that fell. And so you might think, wow, yes, Paul was there, but you know, so much has passed. It's like, you know, they had a Christian movement, but then Islam came in and then, and then atheism. And so you would think people are like, I've done all that religious stuff. It's outdated, we tried it, it didn't work. Something else came in and took its place. But that's not the story in Albania. In 1991, Crew and other ministries brought the Jesus film, which is a, a movie portrayal of the life of Christ. And people responded like crazy. They had this hunger. They had this amazement about the gospel that, that God would send his son, love them enough. They feel very insignificant there. And yet God would come to them and love them that much, and people responded. And we met a guy that was, lived in the communist days, and he responded to the gospel. And our leader, Aldo, I asked him, I said, Aldo, why were you drawn to Christianity? Why did, you, why did you give your life to Christ? And here was his response. He texted this back to me. He says, I was amazed at the fact that God loves people, me. And that was shown through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Christianity is the only religion that accepts people no matter what because of the cross. At that time, I saw the Chronicles of Narnia and Aslan, the lion, portrayed that truth so perfectly. It was clear to me that I was like that little boy that ran away and for which Aslan had to give himself to die. All other religions say you must do in order to gain, otherwise you lose badly. Christianity says it is finished. We are accepted, therefore we do to honor God in our new identity. So I have to admit, getting to hear you know, his perspective reinvigorated my own appreciation for the gospel. And I hope that for us, you know, even in America, in, in the Bible Belt basically here, we would never get used to hearing the stories about Jesus. My prayer is that we would wake up every day still amazed that the God of the universe would love you and me enough to send his son to die for us, that we could be fully forgiven, made right with God, and become his adopted sons and daughters. That is incredible thing, incredible news. It's why we celebrate communion, and this is the first Sunday, and to kind of think about that, um, communion really is an opportunity to remember the gospel, to not get used to it. And, and I meant to mention this earlier, if you need to go grab one of these, we do have some right outside the door. Pardon me for forgetting if you wanna pull this out, but this is an opportunity to remember what Jesus has done for us. That our amazement and awe would never, we would just never get used to it. You know, we take communion to remember that God came down in the flesh and he walked among us and he lived among us and he didn't just show us how to live a good life and say good luck, but 
communion is about him becoming the Lamb of God, him becoming the sacrifice, because there is the only way we could be made right with God is for God himself to pay that penalty. None of us had a chance of ever being good enough. We have no chance. Later on in Romans, it'll talk about all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no hope on our own. But this is an amazing remembrance because we remember that God chose to make a way. He chose to pay the penalty we never could. And so on the night that right before Jesus would go to the cross, give his life, he gave a whole new meaning to the Passover meal. He said, this bread, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he also gave a brand new meaning to the wine. He said, look, this, this is my blood, which is shed for you, the blood of a new covenant, of a new thing that God is doing, where the Holy Spirit will come and it's not about you trying to do it on your own, but we are in a new day where you'll become children of God. This blood is about making a way for you to be fully forgiven. All of your sins, past, present, future, fully paid for. Just take this and drink. Dear God, we thank you for this incredible sacrifice, Lord, that it's just amazing that you would choose to do that for us. Thank you, God, that Christianity is not just some religion of a bunch of rules where we're trying to be good enough to appease some God up in the sky. But it is about a historical event where Jesus, you proved yourself. You were the fulfillment of prophecy and you came and through the miracles and ultimately through you walking out of the grave, you proved to be the Messiah, the one that was promised to come the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We thank you that in you, Jesus, that when we receive you into our life, it is a brand new life that you give us. It's an abundant life, it's an eternal life. We're no longer separated from God, but we become one. We become one in you, God. We're joined into your family. We're part of this family, part of the the family of God, that we have a hope and a future all because of what you did for us. And if you're in this room and or you're listening online and you've never made that decision to say yes to Jesus, respond to this incredible news we call the gospel. You can do that right now. You just simply acknowledge that you're a sinner, acknowledge that I have no hope on my own, I can never be good enough, and that you believe that Jesus is God's son and he came and he died for you and he rose again. You just tell him that you wanna put your trust in him, receive that gift and you will be saved and you will be changed forever and you become an adopted child of God. You could pray that and just simply say yes to him and trust him. We ask this in Jesus' name.